Welcome uh, to the first uh, conversation in this year's Literature for Our Time series. And thank you uh, for braving what, when I was a kid, we just called winter. Um, our guest today is the novelist Miriam Taves. <laughs> I'll just tell you a little bit about her for, uh, for, for those of you who are new to the class, and then I'll get the hell out of the way and let her talk. Um, by birth, a Manitoban, uh, for now a Torontonian. Uh, her writing career started in journalism in Halifax and Winnipeg. My understanding is that what happened is that Miriam Taves, the, the novelist, exists because Miriam Taves, the journalist, wrote a documentary about single mothers for CBC Radio and thought it didn't quite tell the whole story, so she decided to take another run at it in the form of a novel, and that became her first novel, Summer of My Amazing Luck. Since then, she's written five more books, won the Governor General's Award for Fiction, the Rogers Writers' Trust Prize for Fiction, a National Magazine Gold Award, CBC's Canada Reads Competition, and got nominated for Best Actress at the Mexican Academy Awards, <laughs> which is one hell of a CV, really. Um, her latest novel is Irma Vot, Irma Vot, which grew out of and is partly about the last experience, making a movie in Mexico. Um, I said in the first hour, and I believe that in her books, uh, home is both what hurts and uh, what's missing. Um, her characters are all, in one way or another, homesick at home, like Nomi Nickel in the book we're reading, A Complicated Kindness, published by Knopf Canada in 2004. But they are also survivors. Uh, I like the way that the novelist David Bergen puts it, who is also, by the way, a product of Manitoba's apparently extremely literary uh, Mennonite community. David says, Miriam Taves goes to dark places and yet she comes out leaning to the light. With the gracious support of Victoria University and the Department of English at the University of Toronto, please welcome Miriam Taves. You, you just go ahead and talk. You can stand or sit, whatever yeah. you feel comfortable with. So I'm going to get out of the way, but it's whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, Mr. Thank you very much, and thanks, Nick. Um, I was here uh, and listened to part of the, the, the lecture, and I'm totally blown away by, uh, by, by the extent of uh, his uh, thinking about my work, and, and as a result, yours. It's very moving, and uh, I appreciate all of you uh, reading my stuff and, and thinking about it, um, and it's great to be here. So uh, I was asked by Nick to just uh, to talk a little bit about a complicated kindness, and I really there's nothing more that that I can add, obvi <laughs> obviously, in terms of you know what what the book is really about, and and um, but I can tell you a little bit about um, uh, the sort of you know the writing of it or the behind a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, so. It was, uh, let's see, I was in my late 30s, I suppose, when I was writing it. Uh, and um, I had wanted to write a book about sort of loosely based or not so loosely based on my hometown and kind of on my own experiences growing up in that very uh, specific kind of community. Um, but. I didn't know how to approach it. I didn't know uh, where to begin. Um, and most importantly, I didn't want to um, offend my father. And so I always sort of pull, you know, pulled, pulled away from it. I would, uh, I would make notes um, about my town, about my adolescence, um, with the thought that you know, maybe someday I could create a narrative about it. A story, a novel, uh, but I never, I never had the guts because uh, my father, um, he loved that community in a way. I think part of him also loathed that community, or at least was um, adversely affected by that com community. I think it sustained him and it also destroyed him. Um, other people might argue this, but but uh, I knew that that was where he was, and he didn't want to leave, and it meant an awful lot to him. And for me to write the way that I really wanted to write about it and make the, the points that I wanted to make about it, I knew would hurt him. So, um, so I didn't, so I wrote other books instead. Um, uh, in 1998, he, uh, um, sadly, he died. And um, this, was, uh, this was a tragedy in my life, in my family's life. Um, but aside from that, it also did 
free me to write a complicated kindness. Obviously, I would rather have my father around than this book, but, um, but with him gone, I felt um, that I could, could say some of these things that I wanted to say, and he wouldn't be hurt. So I slowly began to write what uh, eventually became a complicated kindness. Uh, first of all, I wrote um, a different book about my father's life, basically, called Swing Low, and then began uh, this novel. Um, the first, I guess I had written about 100 pages or so, maybe more, maybe 120, 150 pages, and I thought, okay, it's pretty good. It wasn't uh, the way that it is now. Uh, there, was, there was a group of 16-year-old kids. Nomi was just one of a kind of a pack, and, um, and I was calling it, the tentative title was, uh, uh, Swivelhead, because uh, Swivelhead is the nickname that Tash gives Nomi, because Nomi's always looking around, like, what's going on, what's going on? And, and so um, when I got to the, about page 150, I read over my stuff, and I thought, oh, man, this is not good enough. But I knew that I had to stop and go back and, and start again. And there was some stuff that I could salvage, obviously, but even that friend, Lydia Voth, was an addition. Um, I had already written the entire manuscript of A Complicated Kindness without the character of Lydia Voth in it, and Lids, and, uh, and then realized, ah, uh, you know, she, does, she needs to have one friend. Um, and that friend, of course, represents the, you know, the injustice of the community, the fact that, you know, you can't be truly uh, loving, tolerant in a community this where judge is what's valued um, in spite of what's said, et cetera, et cetera. Nick has already pointed it out. Um, so that was, that was some of the stuff that had changed. I had one point thought of calling it Ash Park. Ash Park was a place where uh, Nomi uh, hung out in the community. It was a place where I hung out. It's quite an autobiographical book. <laughs> It's probably not a big surprise. Um, my, my mother didn't disappear, my sister didn't disappear, but you know, just in terms of my feelings, I'm a Mennonite, grew up in a small Mennonite community, just in case that wasn't clear. Uh, <laughs> and at, uh, at the same time that Nomi did, the musical references, and thank you so much for making this playlist with the incredible songs, my favorites, and it's been a while since I heard them, so that was so special. Um, so Ash Park was a place where Nomi hung out and where I hung out, and I thought it was kind of a great name because, again, you know, Ash, it sort of symbolizes the end of something, something that's dead uh, and over and has disappeared. But Park is kind of a beautiful word, and I love that, that juxtaposition of, of, of lightness and darkness and uh, death and life. Mm. So, but eventually I went back to Swivelhead. Anyway, wrote the thing and um, gave it to my editor, and uh, he said, uh, okay, we, we, we want to publish it, and, um, but we hate the, the title, um, Swivelhead. And, you know, it's funny because, um, and I still feel the same way, like just very intimidated by my publisher and by editors. And, um, uh, you know, I, I just remember being back at my house in Winnipeg and probably in my pajamas, you know, I'm a writer and, and um, <laughs> work at home. And getting that call from my editor saying, you know, a number of us here, here at the office, you know, which is Random House headquarters in Toronto, a kind of exotic place that I rarely, rarely go to even now, although I live, you know, just a few blocks away from it. Uh, and uh, we don't, and we all, you know, we thought about your title, Swivelhead, and we just don't think that it has the, you know, the gravitas, the weight that it should for, for the book, and we just think it's a little bit silly. And immediately in my mind, I'm thinking of all these sophisticated editors and publishers just like laughing at my, at my title. Um, and I felt like such an idiot, so I was self-conscious about that, and, and um, but at the same time, I love the title, and I sort of secretly call all of my books Swivelhead all of the time anyway. That's like, you know, someday I want, really, really want, and plan to have a book called Swivelhead. Um, but, uh, so I thought, okay, okay, I'll, if you can think of something better, then I'll, then I'll change it. So, I just remember driving around Winnipeg and, you know, dropping my kids off here and there, and thinking and thinking, and going through the book, and trying to find a title from the book, and, and, and couldn't come up with any, anything. And finally, my editor um, phoned me and said, okay, what do you, what do you think? And he had been tossing all sorts of potential titles at me, and I said, nah, nah, nah. Finally, he said, what do you think of a complicated kindness? And we were getting to that place, you know, like in the process that we had to come up with a title. I mean, the book was gonna be published. And, and um, 
So I thought about it, and I thought, okay, all right, I guess it's the best, of, the best of the bunch, and um, and and we went with it. So it was my editor's idea. His name was Michael Schellenberg, and um, and it refers to, and probably I'm just repeating stuff that you already know, but there's a line in the book. Um, he says, there is a kindness in this town, but it's a complicated kindness. And, uh, and for me, I thought about the title, and I realized that it, it sums up a lot. It sums up the, uh, the, the, the so-called kindness that the members of the church of the faith are expected to demonstrate uh, with each other and others, outsiders. Um, and it also um, defines the, the act of kindness, the sacrifice that Ray, Nomi's dad, makes uh, at, the, at the end of the book. And um, so I thought, OK, that's, that's good. It has, uh, it, has, it has many layers, and that's always nice. Uh, so, uh, so I went with it. Um, so that's a little bit of, of history with the, uh, with, the, with the title. And one other thing about this book is um, when I finished it, I was very uh, nervous. Um, about what, what Mennonites were going to say. Obviously, I was nervous about what other people would say. I mean, that's always the case with anything that you put out there. And, and, um, but I was, af I was afraid. I was a little bit afraid and anxious. And, um, and I went to talk to uh, this friend of mine, Di Brandt, actually. And the quote from Nick had put, put the quote up from Di Brandt in an interview that I did with her for Prairie Fire, I think was the one that he showed on the screen. And, and um, she, she's a poet. And uh, uh, she was my neighbor at the time, and a Mennonite, and had published stuff about Mennonites, and had survived. And, uh, and, I, and I needed to talk to her. And so I went to her house. And I, was, and I was like, you know, this book is coming out. And it's, I can't stop it. It's happening now. But I'm, I'm actually afraid. Um, and she was very kind and very reassuring. She said, yeah, she'd had those dreams too, you know, of the, the cars, the, the black plane cars driving up with, you know, full of elders from the church <laughs> coming to the door. And, you know, we, we agreed and we, we joked about it. But it was always something that, that, that I was uh, nervous about. And my sister actually gave me some amazing advice. You know, I went to talk to her too because I was talking to all the people that I cared about and who supported me, talking about this fear that I had about Mennonite's reaction. And, uh, and she said, you know, you know, Miriam, what you have to say. Um, and, and as a result of what she told me that afternoon, I have, I have said this so many times, countless, it seems like millions of times in interviews and, and events like this, uh, you have to say that, uh, you're, uh, that the book is not a critique of the Mennonite faith uh, or of the Mennonite people, but of fundamentalism. And, and again, that's, that was a point that Nick made earlier in his, uh, in his lecture. So, um, and that, and that gave me strength because it was true. Uh, and, and I think that it's, it's also true and it's apparent in, in the book. Uh, so that was kind of my defense um, and, um, and, and my armor. And of course, there was, there was a lot of reaction to the book, positive and negative. And, and uh, I got a, some letters you know, from very angry um, Mennonites saying, you know, but you were such a sweet girl. You know, you came to our place for dinner and <laughs> played on our farm with our children or whatever, and you were so sweet. What happened to you? You know, and and, and, thing, and things like that. And then, you know, and and in a, in a sense, I was used to that kind of disapproval, not from my immediate family. My immediate family was supportive um, of my writing and of my uh, my other stance, uh, but but. Um, I was used to that in the community, a kind of the tight-lipped disapproval. So it, it didn't terrify me, and I realized that I was going to be safe, um, that my, my, my life wasn't threatened, uh, and uh, that that was just uh, irrational fear. Um, but I guess my point is that, uh, you know, you don't, to write, to write something like this, it, it requires, um, I wouldn't say bravery, or, or anything like that, but just an understanding that when something is close to you and when you have something um, quite uh, adamant or harsh to say, um, there, will, there will be resistance. Uh, and I've learned that now in my career, and, and, uh, and I, I'm not sure that I'm any better at handling it, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, try to, I try to make myself big, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and, and understand that if, that if I need, that if I 
say the things that I need to say, that, that there's always going to be resistance from some camps. Um, one thing that was really gratifying uh, was the, some of the feedback that I got about this book um, from very conservative, even old order Mennonites saying, you know, these are some harsh truths that we, and we have to look at these aspects um, of our communities and figure out how we can keep young people, how we can keep young people in the church, in the faith, at least in the community, um, and how we can actually be more genuinely tolerant and loving. And, and, um, and some people use the book in their, in their um, sermons, ministers, uh, and um, not, not a lot, <laughs> but, but, but a few. And, I, and that was very, that was extremely rewarding for me. So, um, so it's been this book in particular, um, but every book, uh, that, you know, there's, it's, been, it's had its, its very specific uh, journey uh, of fear and, you know, and worry and, and not wanting to hurt and not wanting to offend, but at the same time wanting to say what I needed to say. And that's the, every job has its, has its risks. And, and writing, you know, um, if you're going to be true to yourself, and I don't mean to sound like a, but but um, you know, it, it comes with it comes with certain risks and hazards, like like every occupation does. So um, and again, the the idea that all of you here are, you know, have or are in the process of of reading my stuff, of thinking about it of it meaning something to you or not, of it angering you or moving you or whatever it is, whatever reaction you have just makes it all worthwhile. So I'm grateful to you, to all of you and to my readers and, and, and to the writing life. Um, maybe I've said enough now about a complicated kindness and is that, yeah, <laughs> we can carry on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Because you've got mine. So this was supposed to be for you guys, and so in case you have questions, and it will be again, I will throw it at you. It's actually kind of heavy, so <laughs> I probably won't throw it at you. Thank you so much, Miriam, for coming. You Thank know, you, this for a Winnipegger, this is nothing at all, right? <laughs> no. You're like, what? This is some winter. <laughs> um, summer of my amazing luck. So I don't know if I got the story right or even close to right there, but if, if it is close to right, um, what was it that journalism couldn't do, or what is it that fiction could do that? Yeah, journalism. So I, I am. Um, all of my life, and and again, I like the way you talked about Nomi becoming an artist, um, becoming a writer. Uh, I had I was drawn to stories, to narrative, to telling stories, to sh to taking the stuff in my life, my experiences, my emotions, and shaping them into a story. And, um, but I just didn't know, that didn't seem to me to be something that I could do uh, as, a, as a career. So, um, you know, so I studied film studies, because that's, of course, story as well. Um, and thought, okay, movies, film, okay, you know, and I was, as I went, I was inching closer and closer to the thing that I eventually realized I, I needed to do, which was write novels and fiction. And so journalism was a part of that, that process. Uh, and, uh, because it it's also storytelling, obviously. And so in journalism school in Halifax, I had a, this bad habit of embellishing and, <laughs> and just taking you know, the results of the interviews that I would do or whatever and, and just trying to make them a little bit more interesting. And, and of course, that's not, you know, it's forbidden in journalism. We can't do that. And um, uh, I had a prof there who, a great guy who has since passed away, his name was Ian Wiseman. And, and um, he, uh, he, he took me aside at one point and he said, you know, Miriam, if you want to do journalism, fair enough, that's fine. You're going to have to stop making stuff up, mind you. But, you know, uh, you know you'll, you'll be fine at it. But what I really think you should do is go home, you know, take your kids, go back to your, your ramshackle house in Winnipeg and, and write fiction. And um, even at that time, I thought, well, yeah, I don't know. But, but you know, in retrospect, in hindsight, he was absolutely right, and uh, he was the first person besides my parents, besides my father, really, to, uh, to see that, that maybe that would be something that, I'd, th that I could do. Do you think, did, your first degree was in was it film school, right, University of Manitoba, do you think that left a, a mark that we can still see in any way on your books? Well, I think so. I mean, I mean, films, movies, to me, are just as important as books. Um, I need, I need to see movies. I need to see movies on the big screen, not just on, uh, you know, um, they, they do something to me, and 
they help me to live. Uh, and um, I like, I think a lot of people have pointed out that my style is sort of cinematic in terms of the way that I write little like scenes kind of. And I think of my own writing that way too. I think, okay, in this scene, we got this, this, okay, the next scene, you know, I don't know how else to refer to those chunks of prose. Um, so, so there's ways, there's, yeah. yeah. What about journalism? Where's the mark there? Well, or is there one? Let's see. You know, I, I mean, well, I'm just so curious, just in terms of what you were saying in, in the lecture about um, Nomi's uh, wanting to not live in an imaginary world, wanting to take what just was happening there. Just write it down. There. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and that is something that yeah. I want to do, too. I mean, all of my stuff, uh, so it's fiction, so I call it fiction, and, and they're novels, you know, and you will find them in the fiction sections of the bookstores, but I mean, they're all informed by my own And they're stuff. deeply observant. I mean, I think that's what, that's what they have in common, right? It's the, the degree of observation that's required for both fields. Mm -hmm. um, what about, um, you've, you've obviously had a number of literary influences you've talked about before. I'm interested in two in particular because they're, they're authors that we've read in this class. Um, Sylvia Plath and Virginia Woolf, mm -hmm. you, you've mentioned at various times, have been important literary influences. What do you recall taking away from them? Because we've read them here, so mm -hmm. we, we're especially interested mm -hmm. in those two. There are like our heroes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Actually, right at the, at the moment, I'm, I'm reading Virginia Woolf's uh, A Writer's Life, I think it's called, or A Writer's Diary. Uh, and uh, Sylvia Plath and Virginia Woolf, of course, are <laughs> very, uh, I don't know why I'm laughing, but anyway, they're, they're very, very dark. Suicide tends to do that. <laughs> Suicide, you know, and it's a subject that I'm familiar with. Uh, um, but it, um, it, I think that it is there, Sylvia Plath and Virginia Woolf's um, courage and their absolute um, um, lack of pandering, their absolute need and um, will to get to the heart uh, of the matter, regardless of whether it's popular or sexy or, or even interesting. Um, what, they're, what they're doing is they're seeking the truth, and the truth ultimately, I think, kills them in the end, but, but, um, but they, they're relentless, and I am so impressed by that. Mm -hmm. do you, you, so you, some of your journalism was for CBC Radio, right? Mm -hmm. was, did you folks listen to, did you listen to CBC in the house when, when you were kids? Well, not until my older sister, you know, sort of twigged to the fact that there was something besides the hog and crop report on the radio that we could, <laughs> we could listen to. For the, for, for, but uh, yeah, it was something that came along a little bit later. And then CBC, it okay. was the one station, actually, and as well on the okay. television. When we got one, it was just CBC. So. I just ask, because at least in the earlier books, like especially Summer of My Amazing Luck, I hear a little bit of a a CBC voice in there sometimes. Mm. It's, it's a little, it's darker than the yeah. CBC voice, but there's stories, like I remember there's a story that really sticks out for me in Summer of My Amazing Luck that Lish tells about um, her parents daring to date across tractor boundaries, you know? So mm -hmm. right. <laughs> one, one family's a Massey Ferguson family, the other family's a John Deere family, and yeah. that's just not on, you know? Right, so. right, we can't, we, can't, we can't mix, interbreed between the two. Uh, um, Mm, well, mi there might be a re part of the reason for that might be, um, yeah, definitely the preponderance of the CBC going on in the background, but also the fact that at that time I was freelancing and making radio docs for documentaries for CBC Radio, um, and like you said, that book came out of I wanted to make a radio documentary about uh, welfare mothers. And this was in the 90s, and it was a real kind of uh, neoconservative time, welfare bashing. A lot of these, I had been on welfare myself as a single mother. Um, a lot of my friends were on welfare. And I knew that uh, there was far more that I needed to give to that story than what I could do in a radio documentary. And I decided that uh, I would, I w that was, so that was my first, my first book. And I thought, okay, now I'm gonna try and write a novel with these characters that I know and some of whom I love, and others I can't stand, and the, and like you say, that authority thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the with the social services, and all of the dehumanizing that goes on in that relationship, um, and that was, um, and again, and I know that you've all heard this a million times, but by writing fiction, I would more easily get to the truth of the story, that story. So much of it in, in, in complicated kindness is the voice, right? It's so much of what it attracts readers to. Do you remember when the voice? came to you, or did it come in all at once, arrive all of a sudden, fully formed, or was it something that went through multiple drafts to get Naomi's voice? Like I say, you know, that for the first hundred p 
pages. Uh, I didn't think that I had that voice. Um, uh, she was just part of a cast initially. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But when I realized that you know this, she was the one who was going to be taking me through with that combination of um, cynicism and sarcasm and irony, um, but also intense earnestness uh, and, and longing um, and hope, that I guess I just, I don't, it's, voice is, it's a hard, is, it, is that, you know, it's a hard thing to. Well, it's just that I think that, you know, for, especially for people who might have only read this book, it might be a little hard for them to realize just how very different the voice is mm -hmm. from Ir Irma Voth, for example. Right. It's a very, very different voice. And right. I think people might be misled into thinking that it's your voice, you know, right. as opposed to a fictional construct. Right, and, and I would say that perhaps there's, a, there's some of my voice in it, but, but Nomi is a 16-year-old girl. Um, with circumstances, um, some that I had in my life, and, and others, the main ones that I, that I didn't, and um, and and so she is. I mean, she's a, she's a character, she's a construct, and um, there is something very, uh, you know, there there, the voice that she has is the voice that she needed to have as a 16-year-old girl in that community. Um, people will say that oh, she's so harsh, um, you know, she's so so cynical and sarcastic about the community. Um, and and they'll and some people will say you know an attacking me, um, f thinking that I feel the same way. And I'll say, well, well, no. I mean, there are some things that I would be far more critical of in the community now, as my myself at my age with my experience and my distance, than she was. And some things that she would be far more uh, critical of at that age in the community. So, you know, so I think it's a combination of yeah. construct and me. There's there's parts of it, of course, that you know, for me that just are they're almost. Fiction is least believable, you know, when it's when it's, you think it's so so weird that 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 must have come from real life, you know. There's no way somebody can make that up. And I remember having one of those moments with the game that Nomi and Agnes play of hide the sponge, <laughs> right. where they're trying to be so quiet, you know, in the house. The game is to hide the sponge inside the door of the bathroom closet yeah. and not make any noise at all. <laughs> like woohoo, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a great game, though. You know, like if you ever. Um, I would, I would recommend it. So you had no TV, is what you're saying? That we have, it's, um, but so seriously, I mean, that is a, that's an example of my sis, my friend and Carol and I. Um, not, you know, you get bored, you don't know what to do, so you play hide the sponge, and <laughs> when when girl boys can play it as well, uh, sits on the toilet and just listens to see if you, if you can hear, you know, the the door. The cupboard door closed when you put the sponge in. <laughs> it's really, yeah. See, I guess kids, I wasted <laughs> part of my life doing this now that I talk about it. But our kids have a PS3, so <laughs> <laughs> the competition's a little intense. Um, yeah. Nomi jumps around a lot in her story, right? From from sort of subject to subject and time to time, right? What what connects those in your mind, or were they were you allowing? They're they're, they're not just random. There's, there's some sort of pattern. What what were you using? Was there any kind of logic in your mind when you're saying, okay, I'm gonna, you know, she's describing that game, and now all of a sudden she's gonna go back in time to something else? Like, how did you decide? Is it just instinct, or? Um, well, what I do know is that what I uh, some of it wasn't so much the the circumstances of each scene that I was thinking about, but the tone. Right. That if there was, uh, and again, you, you um, talked about this, you know, if, if it was a kind of a darker moment, I would know that, you know, just to keep everything going and right. to make the darkness darker and the lightness lighter, that, um, that you know, I would have to, to keep um, mix, mixing it up. So I would say, okay, here's a dark thing, and now we need to you know, really like chase this with something. So it's emotional associations rather than the, yeah. the chron not chronology and not. Ex yeah, exactly. Yeah, In yeah. fact, um, even after I'd given the book to the manuscript to my editor, you know, he he, he had said, uh, "We just want it to be a little bit longer," which is what publishers do now. They they say. In fact, you have to sign contracts. I think you know such because people don't want to pay. Well, anyway, <laughs> they want a book. A lot of it's a marketing really? thing. I it's like really short evil books. <laughs> and, and, uh, but it's a marketing thing. You know, we want this length of book because people don't want to pay four hundred and fifty-five dollars or whatever it is right. that you pay for a hardcover um, for just a little thing. So you know, so that's silly. That's that's preposterous. Obviously, we here all know that. Just make the words bigger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The margins. <laughs> the margins bigger. I'm really good with that now. These are these are so-called <laughs> progressive lenses. 
But I didn't, but I didn't. Um. <laughs> it's the baby boomers euphemism for trifocal. Oh, okay. Wearing progressive lenses okay. makes you feel. Yeah, they you know, look good though. They look really thing. good. Yeah, yeah. I feel, and I feel, and I feel so very progressive wearing yeah, them too. Yeah, exactly. the I feel progressive just in the presence <laughs> of those lenses. There. Yeah. But the point, the point that I wanted to make just about the randomness and, and that, that my editor had said, you know, so maybe just make it a little bit, just pump it up a little bit, you know. Uh, and um, so I would, I, I went through it actually and just said, okay, here maybe I could just throw in another little thing, you know, like Nomi's thoughts that she has or, or, the, right. or what she sees when she's walking through the town. Okay, we'll just put more of that here, more of that here, more of that here, and so it was a little bit The bike bit random. works for a lot of it, right? Yeah. The, the bike, bike helps you get around yeah, yeah. and helps her get around and see yeah, things. That's yeah, that's her, her mode of yeah, transport. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a cool concept. In your mind, are your books set in any kind of a recurring landscape, you know, like um, Margaret Lawrence's Manawaka or William Faulkner's the one that starts with a Y. Okay, <laughs> you know, Yakna Wapada. Is that close? Yakna Wapada Wapada. -wa. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hell, you should have seen me mispronouncing Mino Siemens last week. I, got, I went with Mino Siemens. Mino no. is cute, though. Mino. Mino's kind of cute. That's true. He'd be like yeah. a little guy. Yeah, you know? exactly. That guy who wanted to be the, but wasn't quite. So, good. like, I think, yeah. for example, I think Falcon Lake shows up and. Yeah. All of your books, well, not right. Rome of Oth, maybe, but uh, right. No, I guess not. But but Falcon Lake is a is a place in right on the Ontario Manitoba border in the White Shell Provincial Park, and uh, we had a cottage there when I was a kid, so it looms large in my imagination. And also uh, the prairie, for sure. I think, uh, uh, yeah, I would, like, I would say like does. Summer of My Amazing Luck take place in the same fictional universe as a complicated kindness. Or is that just retarded? Yeah, I mean, I mean, <laughs> like, you know, in a sense it does, but Summer of My Amazing Luck takes uh, luck. Right, like, yeah, sorry, I said, yeah, luck. Summer of yeah. My Amazing yeah. Luck takes place um, in a city, like in a, you know, in the, in, in the urban core um, of Winnipeg, whereas, uh, Right. A complicated kindness is, you know, outside of that in in the countryside. But essentially, I mean, the sky is always same the sky. Same. The yeah. sky is yeah. the same, and the wind and the smells and the feel. So, um, something I noticed in your in your in, in reading, I've had the, the luxury of being able to reread most of your books like over the last month or so, like in order. And and something that I've, that struck me reading them is that it seems like increasingly. Um, the, some of the, the complicated kindness that we used to see of family members in the earlier books is being mitigated or, or in some sense replaced by the very uncomplicated kindness of strangers. Hmm. That, that increasingly your protagonists run into people. I'm thinking here of the, the, the hippie and the flying Troutmans mm -hmm. uh, or the cab driver in Irma Voth. Yeah. But just these, these people that your characters just run into in the middle of nowhere yeah. and who just in a very uncomplicated way bestow these remarkably generous acts yeah. upon them. Is that something that you've just, just, just happened? No, I think yeah. that's, that's intentional. And, and, and um, my point, if I have one, is that my characters uh, in the Troutmans, and particularly in Irma Voth, are coming away from a place that is by definition, Irma Voth coming away from her old order Mennonite community in northern Mexico uh, is by definition supposed to be a place of uh, care, um, kindness, um, you know, taking care of each other is basically you know the the the, the tenet of the of the commu of the community that they are there apart and all taking care of each other. And um, my point in having strangers and unlikely strangers. Uh, be the actual caregivers is to is to point out that the limitations that, of the that, yeah that the li the limitations the hypocrisy and and the way that she felt incredibly alone um, in that community in spite of its uh, you know big talk about community. Mm -hmm. I read a few years ago that you were writing a, a screenplay for the Flying Troutmans. It strikes me as the most sort of immediately film filmalistic filmalistic. 
<laughs> <laughs> possibly yeah. of being made into a film of your books. Yeah. Is that still in the works? Or? Yeah, it's still yeah. in the works. And, um, you know, they keep the, like, the, this, the film stuff is always endless. And um, so, yeah, it's still in the works. And every once in a while, I get together and talk with the producers. And, and they say they're this much farther and it has to do with funding. And, you know, so, um, but the option is continuously re uh, renewed. So I guess it still works, but you're right. You're you're right about the fact that it is. It's a very linear. It's a road story. trip, right? Too. So yeah. And a road trip. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing how different the film world is. And when we write something, it's you know, eventually we find a home for it. Yeah. But the film world, yeah. it's so much that they do that just we never see. Yeah. You know, they get yeah, the money for absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Very very little control. I think that you have. I just I, I wanted to ask you briefly about that experience of being in a film, uh -huh. um, which was I just you know I don't want to blow the ending, but. Uh, or at the movie or anything. You know, it's a fantastic movie. But but I've seen her dead, so... You know. I died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you made a good-looking corpse, i got to say. You know? Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> it's good to know. I'll know. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. What was what was it like, the experience in particular, of, of, I understand, speaking lines that you didn't yourself understand, right? Right. Um, <laughs> the experience of making that film is called Silent Light, and... Uh, uh, made by, by a Mexican director named Carlos Regatas. And, and it was very, uh, it was probably one of the most intense experiences of my life. It was, uh, it wasn't the way that you would imagine for those of you who do have experience in filmmaking or being like, it, you know, here there are rules and, got, and guilds and unions and trailers and makeup people and stuff like that. Well, this was not anything like, like that. Um, it was just out in the middle of the desert with a very small crew and the conditions were rough. Uh, and, um, and there was a lot of resistance from the community, um, some violence, northern Mexico, uh, and it was all very intense and, and bizarre, probably one of the strangest things that I've ever done in my, in my life, and I learned a lot about uh, filmmaking. Um, it was, in a way, it was really freeing because it wasn't my story, it was Carlos's story, so I didn't have to worry about, mm -hmm. about, about the characters, and he had a very clear vision of what he wanted, very, very clear, and so I just had to follow uh, his instructions, mm. you know, so. Um. It's a beautiful film, it really is. Some gorgeous moments in a camera work. Um, this is the part, I wanna give you guys some time here, but at the part of the end, and I didn't tell Miriam this was coming, um, but this is the part where I ask our guest, um, <laughs> some of you obviously know, 10 uh, very quick questions, which I have um, adapted from James Lipton, host of Inside the Actors Studio. Um, uh, but I don't know if you won't know this, but he himself stole them from a French host whose name is uh, Bernard Pivot. So I'm just stealing them, them back. Um, and I've, I've changed them a little bit. Hey. So, so, you know, just okay. whatever pops in your head yeah. and, and, and you, so you can say pass, but they get really angry when you say pass. Oh, okay. So <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Cab driving. What profession would you not like to do? Accounting. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Uh, it's okay, you can, you, you can ponder. You just passing is the problem. Pondering is good. My boyfriend singing. Okay. Aww. <laughs> um, what sound or noise do you hate? Um, My boyfriend babies. singing. Yeah, screaming, <laughs> crying, and pain. At any point in your life, was there a television show that you watched uh, faithfully that you had to see every, or, or if there's multiple points, pick one, you know, uh, something you watch religiously? Um, uh, yeah, what was that? Uh, family, it was called Family. Welcome. Sorry? The wall thing. Oh no, that was my mom's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what singer, group, or song do you identify with your last year of high school? Oh my God. Uh, oh, hmm. I guess the cars or Bob Dylan or. The Cars or Bob Dylan? Yeah, I like to keep my options. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Depending on my mood. <laughs> you just hurt my head. <laughs> the Ramones. Uh, and the Ramones, okay. Um, if you could go for dinner or drinks with any author, living or dead, who would it be? Virginia Woolf. Okay. 
I can't see her keeping up with the drinks. That would be my only concern. You know, I'd be just settling in. And you know, so. <laughs> um, what book is beside your bed right now? Uh, well, this is so boring, but it is the one that I was talking about, the Virginia Woolf right. book. Right, the writer's diary? Okay. Yeah, I, I do read other things besides Virginia Woolf. <laughs> Uh, do you have a, a, a pet peeve about our society or world that had you the power you would, you know, eliminate and or fix? I'm not, you know, not, not ending world hunger, because mm -hmm. that's not a little... Yeah, that peeve. mediocrity is so often uh, rewarded. Okay. okay. Now, and I will ask now if you folks have any questions. We have some time left. I want to say before I forget that uh, Miriam's books, the University of Toronto Bookstore, trudged through the snow to get here with some of Miriam's other books, which are for sale out in the lobby, all at a discounted price. And that I believe Miriam's going to stick around and sign some yeah, books definitely. for us afterwards. Okay. Um, but we have some time now, and I want to ask you folks if you have any questions. Okay, Tony, I'll do it. So I got it anyway. So and we also have a, we have a microphone right over there on that side, and or I can you know just run around like Phil Donahue and <laughs> <laughs> do this. So is this one here? Yeah. Here I'll, I will just give you this. There you are. Okay. If and when you become uninspired, how do you do? You have any kind of tips or things that make you inspired again? Like do you look in yourself or other people or go on long walks? Sure. Any any tips for and I'm going to have to ask you all to speak up because I did have a, a misspent youth um, in front of Marshall Amps like hello right in front of no it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you become inspired if you're ever feeling uninspired yeah um, yeah that's a good question um, because I often do feel uninspired and, and then I panic and think I'll never feel inspired again um, often so it depends I mean sometimes it just from just going to my my notebook or my computer and just putting some words down even though I know that they're not words that would ever uh, uh, that I would keep that, that aren't but that it just the act of writing the act of putting my fingers on the keyboard and, and writing something is uh, is it just helps it helps um, but also then sometimes just to walk away from it entirely you know and, and just not try for it so hard and just just be patient and wait, and I know that sounds, but um, you know, to be with friends, to see a movie, to um, to read the kind of stuff that you want to read, as opposed to stuff that you think you should read. I don't know if you've read Heather O'Neill's Lullabies for Little Criminals. Okay, yeah. I found like such a striking resemblance between her character Baby's narrative style and. Uh, Nomi's style. I don't know if it was the pushing pathos to bathos, as Nick said, or maybe like the cinematographic aspect. Do you do you notice any resemblance between the two? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that Heather and I have we, you know, I, well, I think I think in both books the um, the voice again is very strong. Um, it's the voice of a a young. Um, in her case, I think baby is twelve. Um, um, so obviously younger than, than Nomi, but um, you know, that, that outsider, that longing for something. Um, um, I, think, I think probably the voice is, is, um, is quite, quite similar, yeah. Nomi doesn't do heroin. Sorry? Right? Nomi doesn't do heroin. Yeah. <laughs> that would be true. the big difference. <laughs> That's yeah. true. Yeah. Anybody else? This one? There's a microphone right beside you. Um, I, I was just going to ask you, I thought the most inspiring character of the book was, was, the, was the mother, Trudy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wondered if, um, you know, how, how you felt about that. And in relation to that also, I had some of the peculiar reading that we talked about earlier with some friends that, you know, I saw the book not only about like one community, but, you know, about sort of a, some kind of a conservativeness that might exist sort of in Canada in general as part of it. So I wondered if, um, you know, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So, um, so the first part about about the mother, and and how I feel how I feel about the character of the. Um, mother. Yeah, what, what place it had to. Yeah, the mother um, is a uh, Trudy is a very significant key key character uh, in in the book. Um, she, um, she's she's trapped. Uh, she. She's comp she's she's complicated. 
Uh, she loves Ray. She loves her daughter. She loves um, to be a mother. Um, but she doesn't want to be in that community. And she can see that, it, that it's killing Tash, for sure, um, and that it probably will end up killing Nomi as well. Maybe not killing, literally, but, uh, but deadening them inside. And she loves Ray. Ray doesn't want to leave the community. So she, so, and a part of, part of her, the motivation for her affair is not that she's simply a, a bored, restless uh, you know, housewife. Who, who happens to take a shine to this guy who's you know, reasonably good looking or whatever and, and likes her. It's not, it, that's not the motivation. It's, it's much deeper than that. Um, queering recognizes in Tash, or at least says that he does, um, that spirit, that unique individuality. And when Trudy hears that, hears queering, say that about her daughter, she feels, ah, we have this connection, Queering and I. And so it leads to something else. But, um, but I, I think her motivation and her, the complexity of Trudy is, is something that um, Nomi doesn't quite get, obviously, because she's only 16 years old, but that, that readers hopefully um, understand. Um, so I, um, and her, her disappearance is amb ambiguous as well. Uh, we, we can all, you know, we can say, I think this happens to her or that happens to her, but it's not. Trudy, uh, I mean, Nomi has a, has a theory that at the beginning of the book she's unwilling to really look at um, and perhaps comes closer to accepting the truth uh, at, at the end. Um, the, the, the community, the conservativeness of, of the community, I think, is something that is um, alive and well, unfortunately, in, in a lot of um, Canadian communities, North American communities, probably communities all over the world. Um, you know, I think it's something that artists and writers and thinkers and students and uh, that, uh, we're always kicking against. Uh, and um, it seems to me um, that these that the extremes are are becoming um, more extreme. That that um, you know the, the conservative majority, and I'm not just speaking politics, but, but just in terms of thinking, a sort of middle of the road, a kind of fearfulness, a sort of stati status quo, materialistic, uh, warmongering in a way, and fearful, paranoid, is something that, you know, that's, that's becoming um, more prevalent and that artists and thinkers, uh, we, we need to be aware of and, and resist and try and destroy. <laughs> yeah, destroy. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, these are just questions that I was uh, wondering while I was hey, <laughs> while I was reading the book, and um, I was just wondering what it was that Lydia was sick with, and where did Ray go at the end? Did he go um, to go look for Trudy, or did he escape like her and Tash did? That was just yeah. I was wondering. Um, so Lydia. So so what is Lydia Lydia sick with? Um, so Lydia is a character that, that is pure, that is, she walks a walk and talks a talk as a Christian. She, she genuinely loves. Um, she loves Nomi, even though Nomi isn't, you know, a great Christian or member of the community. As Nick pointed out, she's also not bad. She's somewhere in between. Um, and uh, and Lydia, so Lydia is tolerant and loving and, and, not, and not judging. She's not judgmental. And as a result, she can't possibly survive or be well in that kind of a community, in a fundamentalist community, because the fundamentalism requires of all of its members to toe a line, to be judgmental, to condemn, and to judge. And so, uh, you know, so so as a result, Lydia gets sick, um, and it's it's a little bit mysterious what she's sick with: mental illness um, or or uh, her soul being eroded. Uh, uh, that and and her existence is in the book just to show that you know you, you can't be a genuinely loving person in 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 a in a community like that. Good time and the Ray and the character of Ray, where does he go in the end? Um, uh, and again, that's also ambiguous. Um, he says he's going to to clean to clean to to clean things up to organize junk in the world. Uh, clearly, that's I guess, metaphorical, but, it, but, but um, we, we don't know. We don't really know at the end where, 
uh, where Tash is, where Trudy is. We have uh, we have good ideas. I think we could make we could make some some pretty you know informed guesses, but but uh, and we don't know where Nomi is going to go. We've got time for just one more. John, wanna? Hi, Nomi. Um, Hi. I just called you. Uh, your character's name is of your name, Miriam. My goodness. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> I didn't even I'm, hear you. See? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just wanted to ask you, um, the, the catcher in the rye, some scholarship has, has grouped a complicated kindness, along with Sylvia Plast, the bell jar, in sort of this category of possibly drawing direct influence from, from Salinger's work. And I just wanted to know if that was present in your, in your mind uh, during writing or what you think of that in general, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am a huge fan of Salinger, and, um, and I think. I think I've read and had certainly read um, by the time that I wrote *A Complicated Kindness* all of his work. Um, mm, I th so do you mean like how I feel about the comparisons being made, or the just or about his work and how it influenced mine? Or? Um, I guess yeah, I guess both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the I mean, it would be like it to have somebody compare my work to you know the. Catcher in the Rye, a classic, like it, 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 that's flattering, obviously. Um, uh, I don't know what he would say about it. Um, you know, they're, they're both, if you want to say, coming, coming of age uh, stories on, you know, in a simplified way, that's what, that's what they are. Um, mm, his, his voice, I think, is really, really strong, and that's certainly inspiring. I mean, that's what I love about his, about his writing. It's so when I read, a catcher in the rye for the first time when I was in high school, and it was so it just blew me away. You know, I, it was so refreshing, uh, and and um, and to me, it it said it 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 opened a door. At that point, I still wasn't sure that I wanted to write novels, but I I know that it opened a door for me in terms of ah, this is possible. What a person can write like this with this fresh, kind of present energy, uh, and so it was hugely inspiring. I will thank um, Miriam for coming and thank you guys for your patience. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the university has, uh, I've just been told, the university has actually officially been closed for an hour now, so um, I'm really impressed. Um, thank you guys. Have a lovely weekend. Gigi Gardner will be here next week, um, and I'll get Miriam out to sign some books for you. Okay.